Your father works very hard for his money and you waste it all on records. Hi there. Let's do an unboxing. People like to do unboxings. So we've got two things to unbox for you today. One of them, this just showed up, is finally the Analog Productions Jimi Hendrix UHQR Axis. Bold as love. That's in this box. And we're going to open that. And then we're also going to open this box. This is the Blue Note Review Volume 2. This is really heavy. I haven't opened it up. We're going to open it up together and discover the contents. Now we know what's in, in this box. So uh, let's open it. Now I want to do it on camera so I have to hold it up. I have a razor blade here. I'm going to use the razor blade. And uh, You know these boxes they're very confusing. If you're spatially challenged, like I am, I'm spatially challenged, getting these things open is, is not that easy. It's like, it's a puzzle. You know what I mean? So, uh, <laughs> it's good. I could run out of tape. I have so much to undo here. Okay, so undo this. It's a nice box. And, uh, uh-oh, I shouldn't have done that. Chad told me that he's going to, uh, he may come up with a version of this with a handle, like you could actually, like just carry it somehow. Okay, I'm, I'm really bad at this. I think this is what I have to do to open this. Are you, you know what, probably what I'm gonna end up having to do is, uh, I'll let the camera go, I'll have to edit this because I can't, I'm, I'm bad at this. They should have instructions on how to do this. I feel stupid. I know some of you are saying, well, that's because you are stupid. I'm not stupid. I'm just uh, spatially challenged. I don't know. I can't figure out how to open the box. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just going to let this roll and we'll see how stupid I can. Look, it, it, the hinge is, you know, this here, this box right here, this is one piece to the flap. And this is one. This is one piece. So the only opening, it's this opens, and these are the flaps that go in. That's the way it has to be. Oh, here we go. Wait. Okay. Success. 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 Does it matter? Should do be. Okay. So here we go. Okay. And there you have it. Under under bubble wrap. Here it is, UHQR. Oh, you know what? I wanted to show you something. For some of you who don't don't know the the precursor to this box, I want to show you the precursor. If you you have to wait a minute, I'm gonna to have to walk away. I'll be right back. So here it is. So this is uh, the Royal Ballet. Uh, this is uh, Answer May, Ernest Answer May. Answer me! I didn't ask you a question. Uh, and this is a, a very famous RCA Soria series box. And the Soria series box sets were uh, distinguished by this beautiful kind of uh, cloth canvassy paper and beautiful pictures and uh, a wooden doweled side. And then you would, it had a slip case, so you'd open it up this way, like so. And inside you would have your records, which I have here, and you would have a book, and the book was was very uh, beautiful and interesting. Look at this. See, you get this piece of paper. Probably a lot of people buy this box. Is I think this goes for like eight hundred dollars or something, but probably a lot of them were missing this program. This is the menu, and you know for what you can eat when you watch this. No, I'm kidding, and. Uh, there's beautiful pictures inside of uh, the, the the ballet dancers. Anyway, I know you're saying to yourself, I want to see the Hendrix box. I need to come to look at these people dancing. Okay, but at any rate, that that this is the um, this is the precedent that uh, that guided Mr. Chad Cassum to produce his box for uh, his UHQR series. All right, so uh, that's that. So that's 
it's just a piece just flaked off. I did that for you, okay? A piece just flaked off. It, I lost money on this just now because of you. Thanks a lot, pal. Okay, so here is Chad's box for Jimi Hendrix. Did you ever get to see Jimi Hendrix live? I have to say, I was lucky enough to see Jimi Hendrix live a couple of times. So the first time I saw Jimi Hendrix live was at the Singer Bowl in Flushing Meadow Park, which is no longer there, the Singer Bowl. So it was, it was a bowl, a shaped bowl, and, and they sold seats around the entire bowl. And the stage, this is the primitive days of concerts, you know, so the, the stage was pointing in one direction, and they had a primitive sound system pointing in one direction, but the stage was on a dolly, and it could turn. So they, they sold seats to the entire bowl, and the, the, uh, the stage would face one quarter of the audience, and the, they were, there were three acts. So it was uh, Janis Joplin and Big Brother and the Holding Company, that was the opening act. No, The Soft Machine with Robert Wyatt. That was the opening act. Then it was Janis Joplin and Big Brother and the Holding Company was the middle act. And then the star attraction was Jimmy, the Jimi Hendrix Experience. Okay, It was, you know, quite good. But, so the concert would start and the stage would be facing, let's say it was facing towards you and I. We're watching and they're, they're performing. And it's the sound, you know, sound systems in those days were, were only so. So, but it was still great be able to see it and then after a couple of songs all of a sudden the stage would go would turn and it would face sideways you so you could still kind of hear it and see it but it would be not so good and then after a couple of songs it would turn completely behind you so it would face the other way and you'd go no and then it would turn and then all you'd hear was but hey I'm in my brain and that it, it was totally useless you heard nothing they didn't even bother to have speakers on the back of the stage facing you so you could hear it even though you couldn't see it. You couldn't hear it and you couldn't see it. It was totally lame. And then after a while it would turn that way and then the audience that would, would applaud that was seeing it directly on and those of us who were sitting at a, at a 90 degree angle we'd applaud also because then we could hear something again. And then after a couple of more songs it would turn towards you and you would applaud again and you could actually hear it. So that, that was the singer bowl. And then I saw him at Woodstock I was at Woodstock. I kind of remember that. I don't remember it completely. I was in a... I was tired at Woodstock. Okay, I slept a lot. <laughs> that's, that's as far as I'm going to go with that. I was tired and I slept a lot. And I, Okay, so now I'm taking off the, the, the quality guarantee. And here is the box. It's quite lovely. Now you have to decide for yourselves whether you think this album, the Axis Bold is Love album, is worthy of this kind of attention to detail. I happen to think it is. I think, uh, you know, the Are You Experienced album, I should get that out too. As, you know, as long as we're doing this, I should show you a few things, right? Well, I mean, what am I here for? Except to show you some stuff. So I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. I wanted to uh, show you a few things that I should have taken out before before I started the video. But you know, thanks to editing, I can edit some of this out. Oh, let's get close. Hi, how are you? So, uh, this is the original American "Are You Experienced" album, and this is uh, the original has uh, this steamboat label, the Reprise steamboat label, with the yellow. Mustard green and pink. Those was the reprise colors. This is the first, original first pressing I bought in 1967. 67? Yeah, 67. And there's the Dymo label maker. My name. See it? That shows you how old, old it was. And the, the label is still there. I'm afraid to peel it off because I'm afraid it's going to take some of the cover. I'm sure I could have it professionally removed. Like going, I could take it to a dermatologist and have it professionally removed. But I'm going to leave it on there for now. And uh, what's interesting about this record, of course, is that this was an, an, a compilation produced for America in stereo. And this record actually sounds great. This is one of the cases where the American, even though this band is a you know European, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy was American, of course, the rest of the band is, is, is British, and, and the group was signed to a track records in, in the UK. In this case, uh, this is a much better record than the British original which 
is this. I mean, that cover, that cover, you see, you know, when that came out, and, and uh, uh, you know, you had to be there, because when that cover came out, it was like, what the hell is going on here? And the back cover, too. I mean, this guy, Jimmy looked, uh, all of them looked, you know, it, it was such a marketing thing, but it was great, because people... People didn't look like this, really, in 19... Not that many looked like that in ni early 1967. And here was the original UK. You know, this picture is really kind of amateur -y. And then the back cover is really, you know, cut-and-paste, collage amateur -y. So, since that's the original British... Actually, this is not the original British. I pulled the wrong one out. This is, you know, somebody's... When I did this, I said... It's got a barcode on there. Who is this guy kidding? That's not the original. No, this was a reissue that was done in the 1990s. You know. So wait, I'll get the original. I have the original, okay? Here's the original. This is the original. You can see it's got the laminated cover. And uh, it's track. UK track. Oh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, and this was 612001. This was the first record on track records. The label was started, actually, by Chaz Chandler, and I forgot the other guy's name. I should know it, because I'm a, uh, I'm a rock historian, but I forgot his name, damn it. And was it Chris Stamp? Yeah, I think it was Chris Stamp. And, uh, and they founded track records for Jimmy. So on the back of here, there's writing. You know, they tell you about Jimi Hendrix, and then they tell you about Mitch Mitchell and Noel Redding. And uh, that... Different songs are in the, and of course this one, they don't give you that. This this one is quite an academic. You know, I'll read it to you. Okay, you want to hear it? Jimi Hendrix, guitar and vocal, born in Seattle, Washington, November 27, 1947. Left school early and joined the Army Airborne, but was invalid, invalid, but was invalided out. That's what it says. It's, it must be in, in the UK probably. Invalided is a word for something. Out with a broken ankle and an injured back. Started hitching around the southern states, guitar picking. One night, one of the Isley brothers heard him playing and offered him a place in their bed. Yeah, I'll gig. May as well, man. Sleeping outside between them tall tenements was hell. Rats running around, blah, blah. Okay, I'm not going to... Anyway, you can read this someplace, I'm sure. The American one was a lot of hype. Be forewarned, it says. Used to be an experience meant making you a bit older. This one makes you wider. Not wiser, wider. With the assistance of Mitch Mitchell on drums and Noel Redding on guitar, Jimi Hendrix breaks the world into interesting fragments, then reassembles it. You hear with new ears after being experienced. Those who have only seen him perform know only part of this experience. They rave about a young man who plays a guitar in more positions than anybody before him. Now, this debut album will put the heads of Hendrix's listeners into some novel positions, be forewarned. You know, I don't know who wrote that. But whoever wrote it, it's... Uh, not like this. It's it's more hypey and different song selection. So uh, of course they don't give you the songs on the on the back of the UK one. I'll tell you what the differences are. Let's see. Fox Lady Ma Red House Red House is, which is a you know bluesy tune is on here. It's not on the American one. Uh, Can you see me? Is on this one. It's not on the American one. I think that's the only differences. Uh, I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna double check. We're, we're gonna get to the one we unboxed in a second. Um, May this be love, fire, third stone from the sun. Remember, and are you experienced? So uh, remember is also not on the American one. So it's a difference, different record, and doesn't sound. This does not sound that good. And it's mono. They didn't release it in stereo originally, and it it doesn't. It just sounds kind of dead. Although I haven't played it in a couple of years, so maybe with a better mono cartridge, it'll be better. Anyway, that that's the original of that. Oh, there's, there's an obituary in here. Is it, whose is it? Oh, I put the obituary of Jim Marshall in here. Jim Marshall, the Marshall guitar guy. I think it's really good to keep obituary when someone drops dead or dies, who's important in, in the world of rock or whatever, you know, classical or whatever. You cut the obituary out, and then you put it in the record, and then, um, oh, what else? Is, oh, here's another one. Noel Redding, 57, he died at 57. Noel Redding, and this was 5-13-2003. Noel Redding, 57, rock bass, played with Jimi Hendrix. 
said. So there's two obits in there. It's it's good to do that because that way, you know, when my obit is written and someone gets my records, I know who's getting them. Uh, they they can they'll be opening this up and the, the, my obit might say uh, kept obits in his records. <laughs> I don't know, but anyway, it's good. It's it's a piece of history, you know. So the record also it adds value to the record. All right, so that's this record. So coming out with a reissue of this. Which do you reissue? Do you redo this one or you do this one? This is in stereo, kind of hokey stereo, but I, I think this record sounds great. Okay, no one's done this. Well, they, they have done this, but uh, Chad didn't do it. All right, so. Okay, so then we get to uh, Axis Bold as Love. Now, when this came out, you know, this is a, uh, this whole, the artwork on this jacket is from Indian uh, religious iconery, icon. Yeah, I Connery, as opposed to Sean Connery. And truthfully, I had never seen that kind of thing before. It was really cool to see it for the first time. So this is an original American reprise copy, and that's the original American inner jacket. And this version is is a very is the rare version with this tricolor label, which was changed shortly after this was released and actually this does sound great this version and this is a first pressing so happy to have it happy to have it bought it when it was new and I can tell you when this record came out uh, I sat down you know, at this point in time, does it really matter if I tell you that I smoked a bowl? <laughs> does it doesn't matter. I smoked a bowl, I put on my Cost Pro 4As, and I listened to this record through for the first time, and it was a mind-blowing experience. Especially the end of the record, Bold as Love, with the, all the flanging at the end, and all that swirling flanging stuff. And the way it just go I mean, that was like, I remember just laughing and laughing, and it was like going on a trip. It was the first play of this record, and, you know, this, this record has got so many... The beginning is hilarious with, you know, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Radio Station EXP. I mean, that was hokey but funny. Mr. Mr. Paul Caruso, who actually is a real guy who lives in Brooklyn. He lived in Brooklyn, I think he died, and I should have had his obit in here. Do I have it? No. Uh... And then up from the skies, and then it's got so many great Spanish Castle Magic, Wait Until Tomorrow, and uh, Ain't No Talent, Little Wing. I mean, this record is just, if six was nine, I mean, that was... All the hippies cut off the hair, I don't care. White-collar conservative flashing down the street. We still suffer from white-collar conservatives flashing down the street and running the government. It's painful, but that's the truth. And Jimmy was so great. And um, Eddie, Hen Eddie Kramer was the engineer. You Got Me Floating, Castles Made of Sand. I mean, the imagery on that song, She's So Fine. That's, uh, you know, that was that was uh, the one hokey song. One Rainy Wish, Little Miss Lover, and, and Bold as Love. It's a great album. It, it really is an album that took Jimi Hendrix to a whole different level of poetry and musicianship. And uh, and pop culture icon icon iconery, I kind of said that. So yeah, it's a record. It's and it's it held up. It is held up as a as a piece of um, not just a period piece, but a statement, and uh, still still has a lot to say today, as far as I am concerned. The art, the uh, you know the musicianship and the and the, the lyrics. The imagery of uh, what Jimmy was singing about the first time you you played this record and he would and the you know castles made of sand falls in the sea uh, everything he was singing about it's just you know little wing the imagery it's just it's a it is a classic record worthy of reissuing and then uh, another label did a reissue of it this was from the early 90s the in Britain. You know, and they they put a barcode on it. Fair. They they made it a single sleeve thing. You know, it has. Let's see, does it say who mastered it? No, it doesn't say who mastered it. But there's a mastering stamp on it that was X'd out. I'd have to try to see what it was. This is pressed by EMI. I know that because you can see the EMI codes on it. 
So A dash one U dash one dash one. So it's the first lacquer. Whatever. It, I don't remember how good it sounds, but it's probably not great. So Classic Records did this record, as you know, in mono and stereo. And um, here's an original British. This is the original British track, which I'm happy to have. And this one, look, it has a different gatefold inner. I think that's a great inner. You don't get, you don't get the lyrics, but you get a great picture of Jimmy and Noel and Mitch. Isn't that great? I love that. And it's only available on this version. And there it is. So it's track 613003. 613003. I forget what 002 was. Maybe that was a, a Who album. I don't, I, I don't remember. I'm sorry. I don't remember. All right. And uh, yeah, it was a fold over laminated cover. And uh, you know what? The American one sounds better. It's just one of those things. Because the Brits didn't cut hot. They didn't cut it hot. It still sounds really good, but it. However, now we get to this version here. So you see, it's got the slipcase, just like the uh, Answer May Royal Ballet. And this is the mono box, which has been pressed, packaged, and it's going to ship out. If it hasn't shipped already, it's going to ship very, very soon. And you see, uh, what they used was the American innard. One of the fun things that happened to me, this is over tw 20 years ago, when uh, George Marino cut these from a digital, first from a digital file, 9624 file, and Eddie Kramer came over to my house to listen. Yeah, that was cool. Eddie Kramer sitting there listening on my stereo, which at that point was not what I have now at all. I don't know what he was thinking. You know, Eddie, Eddie grew up in, uh, in South Africa, I believe, and I have a feeling he sat there and said, this guy's stereo is not very good. Nor was that accent South African accent. But anyway, because uh, I don't do a South African accent. So Chad used, they had to use the, um, the current Experience Hendrix label. They couldn't go back to, to the track label, and they couldn't go back to the reprise label, but that's fine. But it's a beautiful package. This is the mono version, and it's, um, of course, it's, this is the UHQR Ultra Vinyl, whatever they're calling it. Mono by Analog Productions, which I, I've played uh, a test pressing of this, so I know what it sounds like. We know how good this sounds. And it's a, it's a much different mix. The stereo mix is very gimmicky with things floating around the room, and, and uh, this is a much more basic mix, and things aren't, aren't panned left and right, and aren't you know, jump cut left and right. It's a much more coherent mix. Not everybody likes it. I like it. Okay, let's see what you get in the box. You get... You get a little pamphlet, and the pamphlet says, UHQR by Analog Productions. Analog Productions produced this ultra-high quality record, certified to be one of only 1,500 mono limited edition custom pressings. Pressed February 2019 at QRP Pressings in Salina, Kansas. Man. And uh, it says this record was pressed using the finest available vinyl formulation on a manual hand-operated fine build press subject to our most stringent quality control standards. It is the hand-inspected result of meticulous craftsmanship and the highest quality materials. A finer grain nickel stamper results in the ultimate in quiet playback. A flat profile produces true-to-the-groove cantilever perpendicularity from edge to center. Advanced technology and with methodolo methodology ensure that UHQ, our manufacturing process, produces the world's finest sounding records. You have our word. Now, for those of you who don't, don't realize this, most records are not flat. So they have a lip on the outside, and they're raised on the center where the label is. And then in between where the grooves are, it actually goes like this. It's shaped like this. So the stylus is actually riding downhill to the center of the record and uphill towards the end. Now, not to that degree, but not flat. So it's going down in one direction and going up in the other direction. So your anti-skating is going to change. You know, the amount of counterforce is going to change in each direction. It's so going down, even though the record is skating towards the center, you need more force 
to counter that. Then on the when on the way up, it's going to try to lean back towards the back, but they're still skating, so you, you really have to change the amount of anti-skating you apply on one side and then on the other side, which you can't really do. So this, these are flat profile records, which means there's no lip and it's flat. So this, the style, the cantilever is going to be perpendicular to the groove all the way across as opposed to that and that. You understand what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? And that's why. That, that's why. Does that matter in the big picture when you play a record? It, it's not the most critical, but it matters, particularly for a stereo record less for mono, but it still matters, and the flat profile records mean you don't have that problem. You only have a problem if you stack it on a changer because there's no lip to protect the record, but you're not doing that, right? So, then inside you get a United States, wow, United States of America patent, the UHQR patent, registered to Acoustic Sounds, uh, December 2018. And, you know, I don't want to get into a political thing here, but let's face it, the original UHQR records, flat profile, were mobile fidelities. And they dropped the ball, let it go, and Chad picked it up. So, you know, these guys, they don't like each other too much. I love them both. I don't get, it's like a divorce. I don't get in the middle of it. But uh, now Analog Productions owns the UHQR patent. And uh, Clarity Vinyl, they, this is Clarity Vinyl. This is their formulation. This is uh, Acoustic Sounds has it registered, 2014. And uh, they have that. Then on the back, you get the team that produced the record. You get Gary Salstrom, the plant manager. He's one of the experts in plating. He is the probably the leading authority in, or one of the one of the probably the, but I'll say one, one of the leading authorities in plating. And plating is so critical to what a record finally sounds like. Uh, Stan Bishop is is involved in plating. <clears throat> Excuse me. Scott Wendell is the press operator. Jen Crow is quality control. Tony Blair is quality control. And he's also the former uh, premier prime minister of, of England. He fell far down. I mean, I'm not saying it's not a, it's not an important job that Tony Blair does, but when you go from being the uh, prime minister of the UK to uh, quality control at a record pressing plant, it's very sad. And uh, that's what happens when you uh, when you strongly support a bogus war. Okay, I'm getting political. Uh, okay, fine. And then Tina Nuss is the packaging manager. She manages all the packaging. All of this is critical to getting you a good record. How it's packaged, how it's boxed, how it's handled. Then you get uh, in here, you also get this little booklet here. It gives you the technical spec. You get a, a manual. You shouldn't operate this record until you get the manual. And it gives you a whole thing on how this is done. A flat profile. It shows you the profile and uh, they show you I think this is kind of cool I think this is an education in and of itself that and then there's a book this is the book of love oh it's cool because it's a picture of Jimmy and you can see this is early on when when uh, their hair hadn't been frizzed up yet who wrote this? I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing who wrote this Was it John McDermott oh, John McDermott who's an expert I like what he said he said uh, in the early 60s, there was very little difference between a hospital and a British recording studio. That's true. Antiseptic environments. This should be... I'm going to be looking forward to reading this essay. And there's a picture of them. I think this is really cool. He's, uh, I don't think he's sitting on the, on the toilet. I think he's just sitting in a bathroom. Sitting in a bathtub or something. Let's hope. I don't think the back cover should not be a picture of Jimi Hendrix sitting on the toilet. Okay? It kind of ruins the whole thing. Anyway, that's the unboxing. And I think this is a record worthy of this kind of fantastic treatment. It really is. And I look forward to playing it again with a mono cartridge. I've got a bunch of mono cartridges. I've, right now I've got up the uh, the Grado Epoch mono cartridge, which is spectacular in a warm way. I might for this particular record, I might prefer having on there the Miyajima Labs, it, the Infinity. That might be better for this. It's a little, it's a kind of sharper, brighter relief. Really nice, but diff different kind of sound. And the box, as you can see, it's, it's very much keyed off of the um, the original Soria series. I'll put this back in here. Very nice. 
And look, if, if we're gonna if we're gonna get into a fight between the two major American labels doing this and say between the Mobile Fidelity and this, this is a much nicer box. It, it just is. The Mobile Fidelity, it's got that. You have to lift the cover off and you got to dig the record out, and it's it's just not quite as nice. That's my opinion, and you know they will not be happy with me. But my job is to not think who standing behind me is the people that make these things. My job is to think of who standing behind me is you. Okay, that's how I that's how I look at this. All right, this is the box. I'm gonna put this back in the box. I actually will never play this. I will seal it up, and then uh, when I retire, I'll sell it for a high price. Okay, that's how I'm doing this. I'm just kidding. I'm not gonna do that. All right, now let's look at the other box. But now I've done something that I I always do. I lost the razor blade. Um, if I if I lose the razor blade, which I do all the time, the chances are good I'm gonna sit on it. So let's hope I don't. I'll take a different razor blade. I have a stack of razor blades here, specifically because I frequently lose them in the room. So let's open the uh, blue note box. This is this is a much. This is a really heavy box, and it's big. Okay, so I'm gonna open it up. This one should be a little bit easier to open. Hope you're enjoying my rambling because I'm rambling because I wanna keep talking. You know, this is like, you gotta keep talking while people are watching, otherwise they get bored. Or you're saying, shut the hell up, or you're saying a different word in the shut up mode. All right, but either way is fine. I don't really care. Okay, and then, uh, okay. Let's see what we got here. And look what's on the side. Can you dig it? I know you can. I know Billy Crystal used to say that a lot. Oh, here's a note from uh, from Don Was, who still is. Uh, on behalf of everyone here at Blue Note Review, welcome to Volume 2. We put a lot of spirit and a lot of time into this one. Hope you dig it. That's cool. All right. Put that over there for now. Now, the difference between this box and the last one is that uh, where possible, analog sources were used. On the first one, they, they didn't. On this one, they used analog sources, cut analog, all analog. We like analog. And you know, it's interesting. Last night I played, uh, I'm not going to say what it was, but pe people have often said to me, you know, the you have a front-end analog rig that costs as much as a house, and your digital setup isn't that great. So it's not fair for you to say how much better the analog is. So I have invested. I spent the money. I got a discount, but I spent the money, a lot of money. I bought a DCS Vivaldi 1. It's, it's state-of-the-art, and it's, it's fantastic. It is fantastic. And I played uh, a high-resolution file, really well done, of something I'm not going to say what it was and it sounded great it really was incredibly good and I sat through the whole thing and I, I didn't have digititis I I didn't break out in a toxic goiter it was great then I played a record and the record sounded real the file sounded good it just but it didn't it sounded fake but good but really good but electronic I played the record and it was like I'll, the record I played was, uh, wait, I'll show you the record I played. I'm not going to talk about the file because there's no point to that, but I'll show you the record. I played this, Kinks album. I love this Kinks album. This is an original British pie pressing of Lola. This, this has him singing Coca-Cola. You know, they, they, Coca-Cola sued Ray Davies and made him, Ray Davis and made him change it to cherry cola, but the original he sings Coca-Cola. And that's, uh, n these days, I imagine Coca-Cola would be thrilled to have anybody mention Coca-Cola in anything, product placement. But in those days, it was really, this, I haven't played this in a while on my current system. It's much better than it's been. <clears throat> and I heard it like I never heard it. I heard stuff I never heard. And I heard Ray Davis right there on the other side of the microphone. It was amazingly realistic. I sat through the whole record enthralled by the sense of him and it's not the most spectacular recording but nonetheless the sensation of him of experiencing the group on the other side of the microphone performing 
and that includes everybody, especially Dave Davis's uh, version of, um, I think it's the uh, Strangers. You know that song, Strangers? We are all alone. Anyway, it was, he sounded so real, like he was alive in my room. The digital file, as great as it was, it just didn't have that same thing. And that's what analog has, that digital still does not do. And I'm convinced if you take a digital recording and cut a lacquer and make a record out of it, you've taken it from the electronic world into the physical world, and somehow that comes back to sounding more real. And the people who say, well, it's just an artifact of analog playback, I don't care. This whole thing of, you know, taking a symphony and putting it in, in, in between some speakers and, you know, putting it on a file or whatever and playing it back through two speakers, it's all nonsense. You cannot. You cannot make a symphony orchestra appear in your in your 15 by 22 foot room, really. But you can suspend disbelief and and believe it sometimes, and you can do it with these much better than with digital. It's just a fact. I can prove it. I've proven it to people every day from all walks of life, and I'm sticking with it because I still believe it, even though I have one of the best digital front ends you can buy. Which, and it's great, and I, and I have Rune, I'm using Rune with it, and, and I can access all these files instantly, and it's great, and I love it. But when I want to be mesmerized by what sounds like it's really happening, baby, it's a record. And it's not because I'm acclimated to that from being old. It's not, it's not what it is. It's something else. Because young people hear it, and they go, wow, wow. That. Yeah, okay, anyway. Why am I doing this? I don't know, because I'm bored. So, uh... Here's the box. This is called, well, it's, it's the number two, four. So there's, there's, a, there's an Art Blakey record involved in this. There's a tribute to Art Blakey on this called Spirit and Time. Art Blakey was obviously a monster drummer and also an incredible band leader. And he, and he was also an incredible uh, judge of talent. And he would spot young talent. And the number of people, of famous uh, blues music, jazz musicians, who came out of Art Blakey's Jazz Messengers group is incredible. And uh, if I could, uh, if I was a, an expert on the subject and had uh, the ability to retain things in my mind, which I don't, I would could list off 20 people that Art Blakey discovered who were, you know, monsters of jazz. But I'm not going to do that because I because I can't <laughs> off the top of my. Uh, I'm thinking Wynton Marsalis. I think. Well, anyway, doesn't matter. Okay, now I'm opening this book down here, and you're saying, "Well, thanks a lot, pal. I can't see any of it." Okay, I'll try to hold it up now, you know, just because I don't want to break the spine. You know what I'm saying? Give it a second. Uh, uh, there it is. So on the left side, and I'm going to put it back down. I, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to ruin this thing just to show it to you. I mean, who are you? I don't even know you. Okay. So on the left side is, uh, there's a Blue Note review. It's a, there's a book. And uh, it's stitched. Isn't that lovely? It's stitched. This actually, there was a group called the, the Microphones. I have it over here somewhere that stitched also, like uh, an independent rock group. I think it's called the Microphones. Anyway, so there's a story here about this, this record, Jazz Drummers on Their Art. It's got Billy Hart, who's an audiophile, Andrew Cyril, Joe Chambers. This looks interesting to read about drummers. Frankie Dunlop, great drummer. Uh, let's see what else you got here. At any rate, this looks like an interesting set of uh, comments about drummers. Tony Williams, Roy Haynes. Roy Haynes is still going, man. Roy Haynes is like 90 or something, still doing it. And there's great pictures in here by Francis Wolfe from uh, Blue Note, who was the Blue Note photographer. And I'm looking forward to sitting down and reading this booklet. And then here's another booklet, also stitched together. <clears throat> and this is... Uh... Ah, my friend Joe Harley there. He wrote this Blue Note. Tone Poetry and Audiophilia. 
I'm looking forward to reading that. And this, uh, let's see. There's Don in front of uh, some tape recorders. I was honored to have Don show up at my, uh, when I got the Founders Award from the LA and Orange County Audio Society last end of November, but he was there to pick up uh, Wayne Shorter's award for Eminon. But, so it worked out well that he showed up, he was there. Uh, so there's an essay about Bud Powell, the drummer Brian Blade, who's fantastic. Tony Williams, of course. And here's a history of Blue Note. Terrence Blanchard tells a story about Art Blakey and Freddie Hubbard cartoons. Looks like fun. And there's Art laughing. Okay, this is going to be really fun to sit down and read. You can't get this in a streaming audio thing. You can't get it in a CD. You have to have something like this. I'm really looking forward to this. I mean, this brings you closer to the music, to the experience. Okay, so I'm looking forward to that. Next. Wow, look at this packaging. So this is a, uh, boy, they they got that canvas thing going here, like the Soria series. See, it, 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 this, this did tie together. Don't do this at home. Doesn't work. This did tie together with, uh, with the unboxing of the of the Hendrix, but you gotta be really careful doing this. I mean, shrink wrap. Where's a moil when you need one? I'm sorry. Okay, uh, let's see. Thank God there's editing. I will edit. Man, this is this is shrink wrap from hell. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful packaging. Look at this. Beautiful feel to this. I wish I wish this was touch vision and you could feel this. Okay. And they got the blue note typeface. So so what's on here? This this is a new record. This is a new double record set that was put together to uh, I guess to commemorate celebrate Art Blakey. Let's see, this was cut, Kevin Gray, Kevin Gray cut this from a high-res file, and a high-res files can sound really good these days. Yes, they can. And you have, let's see who you have, Brian Blade and the Fellowship, Kendrick Scott, Tony Allen, Chris Dave and the Drumheads and these are recorded all over the place, different places. Um, Life of the Party, Nate Smith, these are more younger, more recent artists on uh, Blue Note. Go Go Penguin, I never heard of Go Go Penguin, but now I have. And uh, Tony, they got a Tony Williams track on here too. This is recorded and mixed by Bob Brockman at the Blue Note Club, Tokyo, Japan. Doesn't say when this was. Tony Williams, Wallace Roney, Mulgrew Miller. A nice packaging, a nice tip on jacket. Beautiful, beautiful jacket. And I'm sure this record rocks, and I'm looking forward to sitting down and listening to it as well. Next, a treasure trove of stuff. Next, you get a, a glassine envelope. Unlike the glassine envelopes during Jazz's heyday, this contains photos. Oh, let's see what you get. Oh yeah, look at that. That's just an awesome picture of Art. Two awesome pictures. Those are just fantastic. These are suitable for framing. Beautiful. I'm going to put them back carefully. Actually, I'm not going to put them back carefully. I'm going to put them down because I'm going to have to fight with them to get them back. Okay, then we have uh, another record. This is uh, Lee Morgan, Wayne Shorter, Walter Davis Jr., Jamie Merritt, and Dizzy Reese, Africaine. I've played this actually already. 
I played a file of this. This is a master from the original analog tapes, supervised by Joe Harley and cut by Kevin Gray, Coherent Mastering. I may have told this story before, but I'm going to tell it to you again. So when I moved back east from living in uh, California, I, a friend of mine had an apartment in Hackensack, New Jersey, and he wanted, it was going condo, and he couldn't stay because he had to do a project out of state. And I was moving back, and he said, hey, why don't you live in my apartment? You just pay the rent, and that way you can be a placeholder until the apartment goes condo, and then I'll sell it. And it was a beautiful apartment. It overlooked Manhattan way in the distance because it was high up on a hill. And uh, it worked out great. It had good sound in the apartment, which was important to me, and an old-school building quality, so I could play my stereo as loud as I want, and nobody heard anything. It was great. And the first week I was there, I walked down the block on Prospect Street, and I see a house, and it was abandoned, and no one was living there. And above the door frame, it said Van Gelder in soot. So there had been a um, wrought iron scripty kind of thing that spelled Van Gelder. And I'm thinking, Hackensack? Van Gelder? Could this have been the house where Rudy Van Gelder did all those great recordings in his parents' living room? Is it possible I moved back a block from that? And as I passed the house, I looked over, and on the side of the house were double doors and an equipment ramp going up into, into the house. So this was Rudy Van Gelder's house. And I kept saying, every, I'd pass it by every day for I don't know how long. And I kept saying to myself, mm, i got to take pictures of this. You know, today, you take out your phone, you take a picture. Back then, this is 86, you didn't have a camera in your phone. And you didn't even have a phone you could walk around with. I kept saying, I'm going to come back. I'm going to take some pictures of this house. What a cool place. I never did it. And then one day, the house was, was, was torn down. It became a professional building. I mean, to me, that was a professional building. That house never should have been torn down. And if it was being torn down, they should have uh, taken parts of it, and it should be in the Smithsonian. And they just raised the place. It was a disgrace. And I hold myself personally responsible for not picking up the ball and, and, and doing something about it, but whatever. So there's this record, which is quite good. This is recorded in 1959 at Rudy's uh, Englewood Cliffs studio after he moved out of the house. That's this one. You get that. And you get this one, Bobby Hutcherson's Patterns. And this is recorded in 1968. And... Uh, with uh, James Spaulding, Stanley Cowell, Reggie Workman, and Joe Chambers. I don't know, there's, there's a history behind why these are being reissued now, and why these never came out, or why they came out and disappeared. And hopefully that's going to be in the book explaining it. And we'll find out. Oh, there's more, but wait, there's more. There's also... Oh, what is this? Horace Parlin uh, playing cards? What is this? They are playing cards. They are playing cards. Well, they're cards. Interesting thing. You get you get blue note cards. Of various blue note artists. Horace Parlin, Kenny Dorham, Larry Young. Oh, I love Larry Young, man. Larry Young was so awesome. Thelonious Monk. They're all awesome. Kenny Burrell. Horace Silver. Lee Morgan, Grant Green, great. Hank Mobley. You get some of the newer guys, Robert Glasper, some of the some of the young ones. Bobby Hutcherson, Charles Lloyd. It was cool. I when I reviewed uh, his last record, he got the review and really liked it, and and thanked me. I love that kind of stuff. Um. And that's it. So uh, you know, it's not exactly a. Mickey Mantle's uh, rookie year card, but these are cool. It's just a, a nice m momentum, moment, whatever it is. <laughs> I'm having a bad day. I'm having a bad day, but you know what? I'm going to run this video anyway because good days and bad days. They're both they're days. It's good to have days. All right, what else we got in here? We got. Uh, 
We got one of these. God knows what's in here. A stash bag. I know I know weed is legal in California, but they're not sending they're not Did I say that really? I did. I'm sorry. Oh it's a blue note anti-static record cleaning brush. Now that's cool. Obviously this is sourced from, uh, I guess from Audio Quest because Joe Harley has a, a relationship with Audio Quest. He works for Audio Quest. He has a relationship with him. He's married to Audio Quest. But this is one of their carbon fiber brushes. Now, a lot of people don't know how to use carbon fiber brushes correctly. So let me, let me show you on a record. I should go over to the turntable and do this, but I, I don't want to do it. This is going to be like almost a one a one take, one camera shoot. So here's a copy of Art Pepper and his groups, Surf Rider, cool record. So I just want to show you this because people don't do this right. First of all, with a carbon fiber brush, it's a minty copy. Uh, the idea is not to press down heavily. You should not deform the brushes, okay? So while the record is spinning, you just want to gently touch, and you see, you notice there are two sets of brushes. There's one in the front and one in the back. So what you want to do while the record's spinning, you want to have the front at leading edge brush just kissing. And this is not a cleaning thing. This is just to remove dust. So the record's spinning, and you just t touch this to the surface. The harder you press, the worse it gets. The stupider it is. Okay, just touch it, and then after it's gone around a couple of times, you m m rotate the brush on its long axis so that all of a sudden the back set, set of brushes is touching the record. Now you've moved the dust from the front to the back. And then as the record plays, you move the record, the brush slowly off the record towards the outer edge and you've got all the dust on here and not on the record. Okay, You don't smush down the brush and deform it. That's how you do it. Okay. Just wanted to get. I wanted to get that clarified. Okay, and I'm gonna put this back in the jacket. This is a Rudy Van Gelder record from I don't know what year it is. And you know who died last week? Ira Gittler. Ira Gittler, who did, uh, who worked for, worked for uh, Prestige, and uh, did a lot of liner notes. Jazz fanatic. He died. Last week, I read there. I've got his old bit in one of these records. I think I know which one it's in too, but I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna take it out. Okay, that's that. And then we have. I think these are all, the CD of Spirit and Time. They just gave you this CD of it, and uh, no John Vervata scarf, no tchotchkes, other than what I've shown you. Very nice presentation. And I'm looking forward to reading the essays and listening to the records. And uh, I will take the brush and put it back in. I'll keep that as a package. Because I've got brushes. I don't need to use the... I'm not going to use the Blue Note brush on Blue Notes only. And the Audio Quest on Audio Quest records, etc. That's it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this little excursion into insanity. The opening of the uh, Hendrix UHQR box and that is going to be shipping now according to chad i'll be writing a review of it on analog planet and the blue note the opening of the blue note second blue note review which i think is a very nice package and the older records are all done analog so you have two two great blue notes cut analog from the master tape by kevin gray should sound great plus the new one which was digitally recorded and cut by kevin gray and i'm sure it sounds great also because the, these pro tools recordings have gotten a lot better you know, I don't care if it's analog. I'm not like, I know you think I'm crazy because I, I made that big rant about the Kinks album versus uh, the, the file. But somehow when you get it onto a record, even if it's a digital file, it has that magic. It does. So I'm looking forward to listening to all of this. And thank you for watching. See you next time.